happy Saturday morning, Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon, whatever it is and whatever part of the world you're in. Uh, it's your old buddy John and with another episode of Fiend Zone video behind the counter from Behind the Fiends. Today we have Mr. Steve Rubin as our guest and he is a writer and a producer, man of many, many talents and wears many, many hats. He has wrote the book, The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia and The James Bond Encyclopedia, as well as other books. I think even a children's book based on the life of Anne Frank. Um, I think that came out in 2019. I guess he'll correct me when he comes on. So, uh, but anyway, without any further ado, I will bring in Mr. Steve Rubin. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Hey, John. Good to talk to you, man. Hello, Hawaii and the rest of the world. Yep. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. I always had a lot of, I always have a lot of fun in Hawaii. You know, they talk about places where you feel like you're away from things. When I go to Hawaii, I feel like I am away from things. That's just what the vacation should be. So I'm, I'm uh, envious of where you're at, but I'm happy you're there. Yeah, the, uh, I'm not, well, I'm not envious at the moment. That inflation's hitting us hard over here right now. Uh, um, yeah, ga uh, gas right now. I think I looked at it last night. It was like five bucks a gallon. I was like, oh, man, I've not seen that ever. I've been over here for almost a decade. I think the highest I ever seen it was like four bucks back in 2014. And I drove by one of the stations in Beverly Hills yesterday, and it was pushing eight. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> so your old cost of now living has definitely went up. Now that's for those those rich old ladies who have the, the guy you know pump their gas for them. So it's called full serve. I think the last time I used full serve was about 1970. <laughs> and you know, Person I missed. I remember those too vaguely because I'm 46, so it kind of was going away when I was a kid. But I kind of missed that. You know, having the guy that come out, check your oil and pump your gas and everything. and Well, they kind of spoof it in Back to the Future when Marty arrives in Hilldale and he looks at that Texaco station and six guys come in to help the car. And that was really <laughs> funny. But, you know, when I was growing up, when I first um, got into driving around, there were gas wars. They were selling gas for 32 cents a gallon. And then they gave away dishes and uh, prizes if you pump gas at their station and those are the days of green stamps and blue chip stamps and you'd go to a store with your stamps and get get a catcher's mitt it was a lot of fun and yeah there was a different time and then they had all these games standard oil had wiki wiki dollars which was a game and then they had coins they, they were giving gas away in those days for very little. It was, you know, 32 cents a gallon. You could fill up a whole tank for tw for four bucks. Yeah, my grandfather's brother, my Uncle Gordon, he owned uh, basically our only convenience store because I grew up in a little farm town called Harlow, uh, North Carolina, no relation to the Harlow and the New Texas Chainsaw Massacre, by the way. <laughs> but um, it was like grocery store, butcher shop, he owned a farm and everything that was in that store pretty much come off the farm. A lot of it. And he had full serve gas station, but I still remember people would come in there and they would pay for their gas with food stamps. I still remember that back in the day. I was like, pay for it with food stamp. That's okay. <laughs> it was back, I guess when you would get the little booklets and stuff. Right. You you'd get all your little, little things and you save up for a, you know, a gift or something. Like I said, that catcher's mitt was a big thing. Not that I became a catcher, but I think I had a catcher's mitt. Uh, uh, yeah, those were the days. Those were the days I, you know, I, I sometimes, cause I love time travel stories. I'm really into time travel stories. And as a screenwriter, I've written three of them. We're out there trying to sell them every day, but I love the whole idea of what would somebody from 1940 feel like in Southern California, 2022 and find out to valet the car costs $25. <laughs> Please tell me that you would do a HG Wales time machine story. I would love that. You know, a movie about that. Oh, it's my favorite of all time. That movie was released in 1960. That's 62 years ago. And you, I watched it the other day. It still plays as well as it did back in 1960. That was one of the first movies I ever went to where I stood in line. Uh, we were, 
Uh, there was a theater in West LA called the Pickwood on the corner of Pico and Westwood. So they called it the Pickwood. And that was the place to go see that movie that year. And uh, the previous year, 59, I saw one of those Japanese science fiction films called The Mysterians, which was all part of that Godzilla era fascination with science fiction. So what I was knew it called that the Showa, Showa period, I think is what the Japanese called it. Was it, was it, it just, they, uh, there was one called Battle in Outer Space, a lot of special effects. We just love that stuff. That was also the era of going to see, um, you know, Ray Harryhausen uh, stop motion effects movies like Jason and the Argonauts and The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Just those are movies that inspired me. And to this day, I just, I continue to watch them uh, and, I miss those kinds of movies. And now, of course, with digital effects, it's like literally you have a an Aladdin's lamp. You can create anything. But in those days, special effects was very special. Well, they were very special. Now it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a beauty to those clunky, cheesy practical effects. It was just something about them. There was a romance to them, uh, uh, like a thing from another world. Uh, sure. The- the big lumbering plant monster and you know it looks so silly and but it worked and even though john carpenter's movie is a classic and a masterpiece to some i still i still prefer the original i just something about the original that i like better yeah, well, there's a lot going for it. I think the black and white photography for the first part. It's it, it's interesting. Black and white, I've done a little study of this because I wrote the book, The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia, about the first uh, five seasons of Zone. And there's something about watching something in black and white that immediately distances you from it. So it's already a little bit offbeat. You know, it's a little bit off kilter. When you put something in color, it's a little bit more familiar. You know, I studied all 156 episodes of The Twilight Zone, and I discovered in in all 156, obviously all black and white, there were only two product placements in, in the entire run of five seasons. One was in the very first episode, which featured Earl Holloman in an episode called Where Is Everybody, where he's wandering around this town, there's nobody there. Well, he walks past a gas station, there's an oil sign. I looked up the oil company, and it was a real oil company, so technically... It was a product placement. It was more of a throwaway. And then like deep into the uh, run of the show, they had somebody saw was wearing a Mickey Mouse watch in the entire run of Twilight Zone. That was all I saw product placement wise. So not only did Serling give you the black and white, which kind of gave you a a little, little weird start, but he didn't give you anything familiar to look at on. He wanted you to be uncomfortable and to be riveted to the screen as he played out these stories he didn't want just driving by a mcdonald's or or going into a texaco or or buying uh you know buying something familiar he wanted to keep you a little bit offbeat and i think that really worked and that's why the original series is such a hit yeah he wanted you to be in basically an alternate universe where you know you didn't have familiarity of anything it was this is it right here. And I, I get you, you know, I never thought of it that way, but it just popped in my head. I was like, yeah, he really was. He was trying to, you know, pick at those emotions a little bit of uncomfortable and not uh, being aware of your surroundings and certain things like that. I haven't watched all 150 something episodes. I've gotten through a majority of it, but. Well, you know, uh, Stephen King does the opposite. In literary, it's a little bit different. Like when Stephen King writes a novel, he gives you everything. The guy's sitting at the breakfast table. He's eating his Frosted Flakes. He's watching Hollywood Squares. He's got uh, the Beatles on in the background. Everything to make it identifiable so you immediately know who this guy is. And then the vampires come through the window and kill him. That just makes it that much more identifiable. You can do that in literary. But in the mo- in the TVs and the movies, I think it's more effective when you have uh, that separation. Uh, you know, Spielberg is a little bit more like Stephen King and Close Encounters of the Third Kind when they show the the that Muncie, Indiana scene where the gasoline station uh, is a Chevron station or a Shell, and there's the McDonald's sign. He wanted to show everything normal was going to hell in a handbasket. That kind of worked in Close Encounters. It's a it's a favorite, but. 
I just I just prefer those old black and whites, like you mentioned, the original thing. And then, of course, the film that was released the same year, The Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, which is another one of my favorites and which I wrote about extensively when I was a staff writer for Cine Fantastique. Uh, my cover story was was celebrated and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, that movie, that was actually one of the very first sci-fi movies I can remember ever watching. And it was just something creepy about that robot just standing out at the front of that UFO, you know, just staring at everybody. So here's here's a funny story. I'm in um, I'm in New York for the first time. I'm I'm assigned by United Artists. I'm the advance man on the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, the one with Donald Sutherland and Leonard mm -hmm. Nimoy. And I'm sitting there at lunch with a friend of mine. His friend is with him. And it's his friend turns out to be the son of Larry Harmon, who was Bozo the Clown. So we're chatting about my article about the day there is to still. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah. My dad's got Gordon in his garage. I said, what? Yeah, yeah. He bought it years ago from the Fox lot. So when I got back to California, I looked up Larry Harmon. And he invited me to come out to his garage. I'm looking in the garage. I bring my friend Bill Malone with me, who's the director of House on Haunted Hill, the remake. Good friend of mine. And the, he opens the garage door and there is Gort. The, this is the nine foot fiberglass statue that sits in front or stands in front of the ship when the engineers are trying to poke a hole in the ship. And he had little wings. I guess the, the Harmon had bought them and customized them a little bit. And they had a little voice box in his front thing to give him a little audio. So Bill bought them and we, 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 we restored, he restored it back to his, uh, you know, his self. But uh, that was fun. That was fun. I was once told that uh, if I wanted, I could have gone on the Warner Brothers lot and got one of the ants from them, you know, about oh, the giant God. ants. They were available, but I, I couldn't figure out a way to put a nine foot ant in my apartment. <laughs> so Ben, we'll go back in the way back machine here. What got you so interested in film and television and all that? Well, I would have to say I was a kid of the movies. Um, um, my parents were both big film watchers, but in 56, we moved across the street from a movie theater. We literally were about 300 yards from the Fox Stadium Theater in West L.A. So every Saturday morning for about five years, I was there at double feature time. And this is back in the late 50s and 60s where uh, they would run a, a double feature for the kids, usually science fiction, fantasy or horror movies. And then uh, during the week or in the evenings, I being an only child, my parents would take me to the adult, the adult movies as well. Not the porn, but just adult movies. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I just saw a lot of movies when I was growing up and uh, they were tremendous experiences. I ended up going to UCLA as a history student. I studied history. I wrote for the college paper, the Daily Bruin. And then when I got out of college, uh, I decided I wanted to write a book and they say, write about something that you're passionate about. So that was my first book. It was called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970. And I went on uh, my film school. I didn't go to a formal film school. My film school was interviewing the great filmmakers who made films like Patton, The Great Escape, uh, Hell is for Heroes, Bridge on the River Kwai, 12 O'Clock High. A Walk in the Sun. Uh, just I just got to know the business from the ground up, and but I, I never could make a living from my writing, John. I just uh, it was egg money. You know, you make a few bucks here, a few bucks there. I mean, combat films as a book sold 500 copies. You know, that wasn't enough to fill the refrigerator. So I fell into doing PR work. Uh, that job on the remake of United Artists got me into a. Uh, the studios, and I ended up becoming what they call a feature unit publicist, where I'd actually work on the crew. I'd be assigned to films like Porky's 2 and Pretty in Pink and Eddie and the Cruisers 2 and Weekend at Bernie's 2 and Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, you know, that kind of stuff. So that that that's where I started making a living. And I ended up working at Showtime, um, and uh, doing the same thing, but I noticed that Showtime was making a lot of movies. So having the ambition now to maybe make some movies, I pitched them in uh, 2001 on a baseball comedy called Bleacher Bums. 
I had been um, working on a set with Joe Montaigne, the great character mm -hmm. actor. And Joe, like myself, was a big Chicago Cubs fan. So we were talking about a play he had written with a bunch of uh, fellow uh, out-of-work actors in Chicago one year called Bleacher Bums, which ran in L.A. at one theater for 11 years. It's, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a fun little comedy about the fans out in the right field bleachers betting on every pitch for a team that never wins. So interestingly, the head of Showtime at that time was a guy named Jerry Offsay, and he was a big baseball fan. So he bought it. And we made that film just before 9-11 in uh, Toronto. It came out in spring 2002. And that was the start of my producing career. And I've been uh, involved in producing ever since. We followed that with a true World War II drama that was on the Hallmark Channel called Silent Night. It's a Christmas movie, true story of a German and American patrol who end up in the same cabin in the Ardennes on Christmas Eve 44 during the Battle of the Bulge. And a woman played by Linda Hamilton are, uh, you know, was the lady, a German woman who held a truce for 10 hours. This is a true story. It actually was uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan went to Europe uh, in the 80s, he talked about this story of this truce. And then that became our movie Silent Night. Yeah, my grandfather was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was in the uh, 28th Infantry Division. He um, he was active army. He, uh, he got attached where he was with the second infantry. And then when they went over to Europe, they put him with the 28th infantry division. And, um, he would talk about that battle of the boat. My grandfather was very open about everything. Now he always said that the more open you were, the less the PTSD would affect you because you were just getting it out. But I would just sit there like you. And I would just sit on the floor and just listen at his old war stories. And not all of it was horrible. Now he talked about the battle of the boat. He was like, he's like a uh, man. He was like, we were losing so many officers that we were actually taking privates into command tents and field promoting them to captains. Wow. Just e nothing privates and having to make them captains because what? they're just getting leveled by the, uh, German armor. The, uh, the, the the stories I heard was just how impossibly cold it was that winter and that yeah. the soldiers would stuff newspaper up their pants to give them some insulation. And they were totally unprepared for that. We're not as unprepared as the Germans were at Stalingrad, you know, obviously. But uh, yeah, yeah. No, the Battle of the Bulge was horrific. Um I worked on another film project with Charles Durning, the actor, you know, the great character actor. He's actually in my Bleacher uh, Bums movie. He plays uh, one of the uh, denizens of the Wrigley Field scoreboard with uh, Maury <laughs> Chaikin. They, they actually work in the scoreboard. But, you know, you think of Charlie Durning, who's this kind of portly actor. He was in Tootsie. He was in mm -hmm. Final Countdown. He was a ranger on D-Day. He was one of those guys who had to climb that cliff that point to Hawk Cliff, yeah. that was Charles Durning. And he got into a knife fight. He was knifed in the neck, nearly killed, but he survived it. And then later in the war, during the bulge, he was one of the guys who had to identify the, the members of the Malmody massacre who were gunned down by the Germans. And he had to identify their bodies. Horrific, horrific stuff. I'm, I'm now developing... Uh, I mentioned to you the uh, we're do, trying to do a mini series on the life of Audie Murphy. I'm partnered with Arthur Friedman, and we've got David S. Ward, who won an Oscar for The Sting, and wrote films like Major League and Sleepless in Seattle. David's our writer, but we want to tell the whole story of Audie, which was only briefly told in the 1955 movie To Hell and Back. But Audie, after the war, became a movie star in Hollywood. He starred in 40 westerns. And he had horrible PTSD that nobody knew about. So we're hoping that the series will bring it out finally what soldiers go through to to combat their PTSD symptoms. I think a lot of what was told about him, and I'm glad you're doing it because when I read history on him, it's, yeah, of course he was drinking and everything. He was self-medicating because he was suffering from post-traumatic stress. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, but mine, you know, Iraq war, I'm not downplaying the Iraq war. It was still bad, but it was nothing like world war two. Hell no. It was nothing like world war two, but would you, would you get the nightmares, John? Was that something that you dealt with? Yeah. Um, 
a lot of mine, which I'm very open to talk about. I, I try to practice what my grandfather preached. You know, I try to talk about mine is it's not necessarily any kind of flashbacks or anything like that. Mine is more, like you said, nightmares at night, um, waking up in the middle of the night, gasping for air, feeling like I can't breathe. Uh, and they thought it was sleep apnea at first. They did a sleep test on me. And they were like, no, it's not apnea, but your brain activity. They said my brain activity when I was asleep was higher than it was when I was awake. Wow. Because they, were like, they said it's like you're constantly on alert. And they were you affected by loud noises as well. If some like a car backfired, would it freak you out a little bit? Yeah, we got the hell mortared out of us on a daily basis. I mean, they were bad shots, thank God. They weren't good at aiming them, but they mortared the crap out of us every day. Um, and then when you went outside to wire, it was just that that understanding that when you all went outside that wire, you didn't know. I mean, it was that thing of, okay, well, I'm going from the safety of this big forward operating base and going out here into the wilds of the Middle East here, and I might not come back because I, I, I don't know how you did it. I, I frankly would have stayed in the inside the gates a lot, I, but you obviously you could get claustrophobia. So would you go into town and get something to eat or what would you do there? No, we would just go in the town and patrol. Um, oh, I see. Uh, we were told not to buy anything from the street vendors, but there, I, I, I'm going to tell on myself, we used to, <laughs> we used to go out there and there was this, this kid that used to make this bread and we would always get out there and we'd sneak off and we'd go over there to him and we'd buy and you, for like, you know, two bucks, we could get this big old sack full of this bread. It was like a pita bread almost. Mm -hmm. That was, and still to this day, the best bread I have ever had in my life. I mean, you could literally just sit there and eat it with nothing else on it. <laughs> and I would I am, go for that too. Absolutely. And, you know, dates and stuff, you know, like, w like we have dried fruit here in the States, but their dried fruit, way different. It, um, we use a lot of preservatives and chemicals and crap that we ain't supposed to eat. And over there, it was just natural. And it was such a difference, you know, such a big difference. And you can clearly tell the Middle East was such a beautiful, beautiful place at one point in time. I mean, you can, if you try to block out all the bad you see, you can tell this used to be like a shining diamond upon the earth, if that's a bad uh, <laughs> analogy. Listen, I just took a plane flight. I went to Dubai for a week. And uh, Dubai is one of the most gorgeous cities I've ever seen. You know, it's a brand new city, pretty much. It's got, it's a safe city. It's a clean city. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of like uh, the Middle East. I think we would all like to go to because it doesn't have many trouble there. Um, yeah. yeah they, for, they forbade it there in Dubai. You, you try to pull some terrorist activity in Dubai, you're going to get a, uh, Going to get some jail time, probably worse. They um, said that if you leave a hundred dollar bill on your bedspread, and if uh, you'll come back to it after a day's sightseeing, it'll still sit, be sitting there. They say that the the hotel staff know that if they steal, they'll be deported, and that means that they they adhere to it. So it makes it a very safe environment. It's a little throwback in the sense of you know in the eighties we were all shopping mall crazy. Everybody would spend their weekends at the shopping mall. We don't do that much anymore because everybody buys on Amazon. But uh, Dubai, being such a hot country, has invested in these huge shopping malls, which are the social centers of the community. I mean, they, they make our shopping centers look like dime stores. The one thing I always admired about what you were talking about with the $100 and you could come back to it later. The one thing I always admired about the Muslim religion or the religion of Islam is... That is one of their biggest, biggest rules. You should never steal. I mean, and, you know, true Muslims, I mean, you don't have to worry about that. They they would never steal from you. Um, now, I don't know about you being an infidel. They might. But, I mean, the ones that I've always run into, they were always very honest and very legit. Um. 
like they would talk about how they would be punished if they ever stole. Like they would literally talk about how you back in the olden days they'd cut your hands off if you stole. They would something. cut your hands off. That will put the fear of God in anybody. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, the, the, I have I have respect for cultures who are really able to keep that kind of how do, how would you describe it? it's just a respect for the world uh, i went to tokyo for the first time and the japanese they don't even throw cigarette butts on the street you can walk through tokyo any time of day first of all you can't find a trash can to save your life nobody has trash or they deal with it but they don't even throw cigarette butts on the ground it, you could eat off the ground and i think that it always saddens me when I go to cities where there's dump trash everywhere. You know, it's just bad. And of course, now we're living in a world with homeless people everywhere. I mean, I live in L.A. and L.A.'s got some of the worst homeless situations in the world. We do. Here it's too. very sad. Yeah, it's very sad. And I think that um, uh, I know it's an economic thing. People have nothing. They don't think about, you know, not throw, just throwing trash on the ground. But it's something that it's it's kind of sad. Yeah, Hawaii has got a really bad litter problem. Just people throw whatever anywhere, and I get it. We're on a very overcrowded island. There's a lot of people here and just, you know, very little space for us all. But when you actually go out and you actually look at this island, it's like, like, wow, if, you know, this has to be one of the greatest creations on the face of this earth is just here, you know, and why would we want to dirty it up and put chemical plants on it? Like, we got some kind of chemical plant or something up the street here, and it's just such an eyesore because it's like Pearl Harbor, and you got electric power station, and then some kind of textile plant or something. And it's like, eh. When I was uh, on Maui last year, uh, I found it interesting that you could not bring normal suntan lotion out to the boat, you know, on the tours. They'd say you've got to have a type of suntan lotion that won't destroy the coral reefs. So I thought that was, from an environmental point of view, that was kind of nice to hear. But no, I know there's issues. Um, yeah, the, 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 we got We got to protect these beautiful places because we want to keep coming back to them as much as you know as we can. Yeah, and the coral reef, uh, from what I've been learning over here, has been dying a little bit. You know, and you lose that, that aquatic ecosystem is just going to go you know, big time. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I still enjoy to this day. I, I I've been coming out to Maui for. 30 years, 35 years, I still like to go out to the Molokini, you know, the Molokini Atoll and do a little bit of, uh, of uh, snorkeling. Um, I, I still enjoy that very much. You should go over to Kauai sometime. Kauai is beautiful too. I did. I did. I had a bad experience, unfortunately. It had nothing to do with Kauai. I caught the flu. So my wife and I were traveling around Kauai and my head was in my lap practically. <laughs> so I definitely, I definitely want to come back to Kauai and, um, you know, I have spent some time on the big Island as well. And that's the, always fun. Is there, are there any volcanoes that are erupting at the moment in Hawaii? Uh, there, them ones on big Island are always in a state of like constant, not necessarily eruption, but you know, constantly spewing out lava. Because these islands, they talk about how they're just continually growing, uh, especially Big Island. Now, our volcano here, we call it Diamond Head. Right. It, it It's collapsed. It's, you know, it's dead now. Now, could it ever erupt again? Uh, maybe, and I would hope not, because if you look down into the crater of Diamond Head, there's actually like some uh, houses. I don't know if it's like people living there, but you can look and see like houses because I've been there. Isn't there a cemetery there? Isn't that where Punchbowl is? Yeah, yeah, I think that might be the cemetery. Oh yeah, that's that's the famous punch bowl. I think Ernie Pyle's body is buried there. Um, sure, sure. No, hey, you want to talk about James Bond? Have you seen the new James Bond movie? Not yet, not yet. I, I'm going to. Um, when we talked on the phone that day, I told you I am. I'm a big Sean Connery guy, and uh, I don't know. I, I like Roger Moore too, and and Timothy Dalton those guys but i don't know i'm such a stickler for connery i just always thought he was the perfect bond and maybe it was because he was the first 
I don't know. Well, I think he brought something to the table. First of all, um, Fleming's, you know, there's always a talk about Fleming's original idea. I mean, there was, you know, um, the look of Hoagie Carmichael of all things with that kind of rat type face or that hawk nose uh, and, you know, Trevor Howard maybe, but I think, I don't think Fleming realized what Connery was initially, but he was so good. And those first four films, uh, Dr. No from Russia would love Goldfinger and Thunderball. He just killed, you know, when he got to, he only lived twice. He started to like lose interest in the character. And that movie wasn't written as tightly as the uh, other movies, primarily because the original Fleming novel, You Only Live Twice, was not very good. It's not very cinematic. It wasn't, you know, the kind of movie that uh, that carried on the Bond tradition. So they had to rewrite it, and it didn't do very well, uh, or as well as the others. But Connery in those first four was killer. Now, I think as we mentioned when we first talked, um, I've become a big fan of Daniel Craig. I thought that his 15-year run from Casino Royale to uh, the latest one, No Time to Die, he brought a sense of grittiness to the role that worked well for the 21st century. I thought that he had a uh, a quality, some people called it a thuggish quality. You know, this is not a pretty boy. This is not a Pierce Brosnan. This is not a uh, Roger Moore. And I thought that that served the character well. I think Daniel Craig has that... Um... He has that Connery sex appeal. You can tell he's rough around the edges, but there's an eloquence to him, you know, still, still very well spoken, uh, dapper just, and just all fun. that. Stuff. Just fun but, to watch. I mean, the very first scene practically in his reign, he's chasing that bomb maker in Casino Royale up that construction crane. And then the guy's a parkour specialist. So he's running and jumping and Connery, I'm Connery. Craig, you know, has him step for step. And I thought that was just jaw dropping because when Craig got the role and it was announced that a blonde was going to play Bond, we said, you got to be kidding me. A blonde Bond? Get, give me a break. But he won me over immediately. And although the movies have not been consistent, I think he's been consistently terrific. What inspired Fleming to make James Bond? I never heard his backstory on what inspired him. Was it the old Russian secret services back during World War II and all that well, kind of stuff? Well, um, or not Russian, but English, I mean, sorry. Well, Ian Fleming was a member of the British intelligence community. He was in naval intelligence, so he was attached to the Admiralty as a naval operative. And from what I gather, he was what you call a spy master. He would send groups of uh, English agents onto the continent into occupied France. And a lot of the stories that he later turned into James Bond novels were influenced by his being the spy master. He was also a, a very uh, colorful journalist. I think during the 1930s, one of his first plum assignments is he was assigned to a trial in Moscow of some, I believe, British engineers who were being accused of spying. And Fleming went there and apparently his stories and dispatches really impressed people. So he had a flair for writing, which he certainly put on hold during the war. And then after the war, he got a plum assignment with one of the top British newspaper syndicates. And uh, he um, they wanted him to, to run the paper. And he said, well, you got to give me a three months off every year so I can go uh, go to Jamaica because that's where he had a home. And on one of those trips, and I believe 51, he started Casino Royale and wrote his first novel. And that was the first James Bond novel. Uh, and every year he would go back to Jamaica to write a Bond novel. He did that for about 12 years. He was essentially like the first true super spy character in popular culture, wasn't he, James Bond? Certainly for the modern era. You know, uh, you're right. I mean, there were detectives before, but uh, not, not a spy like Bond. Uh, and, of course, Bond spawned a lot of imitators over the years, not only in literary, but in movies and TV. As I explained to people, when the Bond movies were released back in the early 60s, they had no competition. They were just they were really the cat's meow in terms of entertainment. 
today Bond has to compete with the Jason Bourne movies, the Mission Impossible movies, even the Fast and the Furious series. Because even though it's a bunch of crazy car chases, that's what Bond used to be about. You know, they used to, you do a car chase in a Bond movie, you got to compete with what they do on Fast and the Furious now. So let's see, I'm looking at it right now. It said that, uh, okay, Fleming did it as a book series first. And then I guess in 1961, uh, Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman purchased it for film. It goes back a little Fleming. earlier than that. Uh, the first producer who had an inkling of what Bond should be was a kind of uh, arrogant upstart named Kevin McClory, who made a little uh, a movie called The Boy and the Bridge uh, which got some acclaim in England. And then he approached Fleming uh, to and told him to his face that your books are not very cinematic. So Fleming listened to this guy and uh, he sat down and I guess McClory brought in a writer named Jack Whittingham and they conceived of a story called Latitude, <clears throat> Latitude 78 West. Now, McClory as an assistant director had worked for Mike Todd on Around the World in 80 Days. So he knew what was cinematic and big screen entertainment. So they created this story about an atom bomb hi hijacking from an airplane, about it, you know, getting on an American base, stealing some atom bombs. But nobody would touch it. McClory did not have that big a reputation to get a big movie going. So the project fell apart, as many films do. And Fleming did a very bad thing. <clears throat> He decided to write his annual James Bond novel that year and base it on their materials. He changed the title from Latitude 78 to Thunderball. And so Thunderball comes out that year and he's immediately sued by Whittingham and McClory. And in a two year court case, which apparently caused uh, Fleming so much nervous tension and stress that it may have contributed to his untimely death at the age of 56. He lost all the film rights. So those rights went to uh, McClory. So when Broccoli and Saltzman come to Fleming in 61, he's in the middle of the key court case. So he can't give them Thunderball, but he gives them all the other books. And they start making their series in 62, starting with Dr. No. And um, McClory- That's the Eon- that's the That's Eon the, Films. Eon Productions, Eon standing E-O-N, everything or nothing productions. And <laughs> uh, they started to uh, do very successful. And McClory found that he couldn't get anybody else interested in the Bond movie because the Broccoli and Saltzman series was the front and center. So he went to Broccoli and Saltzman and said, listen, I've got this Bond book. Why don't we do a co-production? And if you watch Thunderball, the first credit for producer is Kevin McClory. It's not Broccoli and Saltzman. They get the presentation credit. So uh, that's how uh, the series began. And um, But interestingly, the deal that McClory made with Broccoli and Saltzman stipulated that he can't do another Bond movie for 10 years. See, McClory claimed that all the variations of Thunderball could be a series of Bond movies because you're dealing with Spectre and their various plots. So 10 years go by, it's 1975, and McClory announces in the Hollywood Trade Papers a, series, a movie called James Bond of the Secret Service. Now, Broccoli, who was pretty much running the operation now on his, on his own, he did not want this rival Bond movie to go. Because what had happened back in 67, we talked about You Only Live Twice earlier, the same year that... Um, you Only Live Twice uh, came out. Uh, the spoof of the Bond series Casino Royale came out. That's the one with Woody Allen and Peter Sellers and David Niven. And that's because Charlie Feldman, like McClory, had the rights to Casino Royale that uh, Broccoli and Saltzman also didn't have. There were two books that are considered the, um, you know, the orphan books. So Broccoli was burnt that year because everybody thought that spoof was the official Bond movie. And it was not very good. So when his official Bond movie came out that year, the Only Live Twice movie, it didn't do the numbers they expected. So when it comes to 75, he's about to be burnt again about a rival Bond movie. <coughs> Excuse me. He decided not to do it. He, he didn't want them to do it. So they basically um, got into a legal tussle. And uh, for about eight years, 
broccoli and McClory went back and forth. And the irony is, is that McClory later hooked up with a lawyer named Jack Schwartzman, and they did what is essentially a Thunderball remake. It's called Never Say Never Again. It was Connery's last turn as Bond. Warner Brothers brought that out. Uh, after all this sturm and drang about not wanting a rival Bond movie in the marketplace, what happens to Broccoli again? It's the same year he brings out Octopussy. So Never Say Never came, comes out after Octopus. I think Octopussy was released first and did better, but both films did pretty well. So that gives you kind of a feeling of how the series evolved. And now the family, uh, Cubby Broccoli passed away in the 80s. His daughter, Barbara Broccoli, runs the Empire now with his stepson, Michael Wilson. And they pretty much, uh, they run the show and they've got the show to themselves now. There are no rival Bond movies anymore. Does the Fleming family have any stake in or claim to it anymore now since Ian passed away? Did they ever retain any kind of rights at all? I think so. I think so. All the profits that Fleming would have uh, received go to the family. Uh, I'm not sure who's alive in that family, but uh, I think they still get a piece of the action. It's interesting that Ian Fleming wrote his last James Bond novel in 1963 or 64. He died in 64. Um, so the, his legacy, I think, is 13 novels and two collections of short stories. Ever since, uh, the, well, the 70s, there have been no movies based on Bond novels. They're all original ideas. And even though the Fleming estate still licenses Bond novels to different authors to create the tradition of Bond, the interesting thing is they've never wanted to make a movie of any of those novels. It's almost like if it's not Ian Fleming, we'll do our own thing. So because they're every every few years, there's a new James Bond novel. I confess I haven't read them. Fleming is kind of. Um, it's kind of like the Bible to me. So uh, if I want to read a Bond novel, I'll go back and reread one of the originals. And there is so much fun to read. You know, just getting that 50s mindset, you mm -hmm. feel like you're back in there. I just read Dr. No last year for the first time in 40 years, and it was just terrific to read it. Fleming was quite a colorful writer. If so, Ben, you're such a fan of Fleming, you don't care too much about the stuff that came after. If they approached you and wanted you to write, a James Bond novel, would you be against it or would you go for it? I'd rather write a movie, frankly. And I, 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 being a screenwriter, I think I, I think more uh, visually as a writer, I, I don't have a great relationship with the Bond producers. I'm kind of a bit of a maverick because I do my books uh, kind of outside their ages. But, um, you know, uh, I tried my hand at writing a novel last year. I took one of our old screenplays and turned it into something. I'm still hopeful we can say um, but uh, writing a novel is tough. You, you've yeah. got a lot of writing to do. You know, screenwriting is a little bit of shorthand because you don't have to fill in all, you know, great gaps, but it'd be challenging. Same with what I, I used to write comic scripts for comic books. It's kind of the same thing as screenwriting. You know, you're describing to the artist or directors or whatever, what you want to see on the panel and in their screen or whatever. Yeah. I tried my hand at writing some comic scripts about three years ago. I still got all of them. It never took off and I'm hoping maybe someday I can revisit it before I leave this big old blue green marble. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've been focusing on comedy and I think that's one genre that's tough to sell, but we certainly could use a good and, injection of comedy because i think a lot of the comedy i see these days is pretty piss poor i think a lot of comedy i grew up um like you i was a big fan of the older movies and stuff and i was raised and i've said this many times in a lot of the uh other interviews i've done so i apologize guys for repeating myself but i was brought up on um abbott and costello three stooges little rascals um laurel and hardy uh, Marx Brothers. Yeah, Marx Brothers. Uh, hell, Sanford and Son, for God's sakes. Uh, they all in the family with old Archie Bunker, which didn't hold up well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just different stuff like that. But yeah, you couldn't make that show today. No way. Um, Let me turn off the phone. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. 
I, I usually turn off my phone. Um, yeah, no, we, um, I'm, I'm partnered with Billy Reback, and Billy is one of the funniest men in Hollywood. He was one of the original writer producers on Home Improvement, the Tim Allen series. He's just a professor of comedy, and we've had such a Jones lately to create some fun stories. And we're out there uh, right now. We're trying to sell a comedy called 7-Eleven B.C., it's about 10 people in a Plano, Texas 7-Eleven on the day the city activates their super collider. And when the super collider uh, reaches its point of, uh, of extreme energy, the Slurpee machine in the 7-Eleven explodes in a short circuit. And the whole building is uprooted out of the space-time continuum, ends up in the year 7-Eleven BC, ancient Egypt in the middle of a civil war. So these people have to figure, it's it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy, but it's kind of a little bit of uh, back to the future meets the Egyptian. And Egyptians probably think they're gods and stuff as came from the sky. <laughs> well, the, the, good, the good Pharaoh is out there wandering in the desert and he collapses and they bring him into the 7-Eleven, which is in an electromagnetic bubble. So the power's still on and they give him a Slurpee and he thinks it's the, the drink of the gods. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping the 7-Eleven company is going to come on board and be part of our production mix because they only have about 30,000 stores worldwide. So we think there'd be a good promotional thing there. But the movie's called 7-Eleven BC. It's really funny. See, I enjoy comedy like that. And the thing I, I'm like you, I hate about comedy now. It's all about how vulgar can I be? We have fun. a rule that we will not give an f bomb if we can avoid it. And in writing, we've written twenty pilot, we've written twenty spec scripts, and I don't think we've used the f bomb more than twice. And uh, we don't go for that cheap uh, laugh. We try to use language. We, I would say, we're kind of a little bit of a throwback to Mel Brooks and Woody Allen. You know, trying to go for something that's a little more interesting language wise because we love language. And I think that um, it's just challenging. I think that some people think that in the studios and the streamers, they think that American comedy doesn't translate overseas. But I think that what we've been focusing on is a lot of physical comedy, which is, I think, translates very nicely. Yeah. I mean, when you look back at like groups like Monty Python as a group from the overseas, people might say, well, they were, you know, they pushed boundaries and they were kind of vulgar. Not really. When you really go back and watch all their stuff, they didn't rely solely on being, you know, potty mouthed for the entire movie. I mean, when you watch uh, the Holy Grail, they might say, you know, piss off and stuff like that every once in a while. But other than that, there was really not a whole lot of vulgarity in that movie. When you're using a lot of vulgarity, you're really being lazy as a writer. You know, you're going for the cheap laugh. And, uh, you know, I really feel that um, comedy should be earned. You know, you should get the laugh on an earned laugh. And, you know, um, I just, uh, I, you know, you talk about Abbott and Costello. One of my favorite films of theirs is, uh, is when they do, they do the Jack and the Beanstalk story. <laughs> <laughs> and Lou plays the little Jack. And it's just, just really funny stuff. And it still plays so well today. And, of course, I was watching uh, They Meet Frankenstein. Albert and Costello meet Frankenstein. That's my favorite. Still, just, just, just terrific. I think they say that Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein turned horror off the channel for about 15 years because nobody can look at a horror seriously. <laughs> but it was like, it was almost like an all-star cast. I mean, you had Abbott and Costello, you had Boris, no, no, not Boris Karloff, but you had Bella Lugosi, you had Lon Chaney Jr. I mean, it was blah, 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 right on down the line. It was just, I'm pretty I sure know, it was a very expensive, expensive production. For those days, perhaps, but not for our times. If they spent a million dollars, I would have been surprised, which is the coffee budget these days on a Marvel movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the one movie I do love with Abbott Costello, have you ever seen Africa Screams, where they dupe this lady into believing that uh, Costello knows where the, uh, the diamonds in Africa are because he 
lie because they both work in a library and they overhear this girl talking about oh i need to find these these diamonds and whatever so bud being the you know the swindler of the two tells this woman that luke costello was a great adventurer and went to africa and even found the diamond mines in africa and all this stuff and i've never so heard get, of that title though you said africa screams yep Are you sure that's the title yep Really, I've got to write that one down because I, I love the premise. That's funny. That to it's me is like I, I, Lou, that was like Lou Costello at his greatest to me, with his childlike, you know, an, antics were the whole. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. No, it's funny. It's funny. I actually took a um, a hosting class last year. Uh, I was trying to hone my you know, ability to do some of my own hosting because I have my own podcast now. And uh, I, I, the person who um, taught me was Marky Costello, his granddaughter. So we were talking all about Lou and just a very special man. God, I would love to talk to her because her grandfather, her grandfather was part of my favorite comedy duo <laughs> of all time. Sure, sure. Because... I have yet to see anybody get close to Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, to be truthfully honest. Well, it's interesting how comedy teams pretty much don't exist anymore. You know, it's all single stand-up comics, et cetera. Uh, I think that uh, the um, concept of working off something, that, that's why I enjoy working with Billy. I think in writing comedy, having a partner really helps because you bounce ideas off each other and – Billy will tell me if something is funny or not. You know, he really knows funny. And I get an opportunity to present him with some real strange stories. And he, he doesn't look askance at me. He says, oh, that might be interesting. We're writing one now. It's uh, it's called My Three Sons. And it's uh, spelled S-U-N-S because it's about Earth's first colony on an exoplanet. And it's, it's pretty funny. It's just, you know, it's... Uh, you know how I don't know if they have one in Hawaii. You know the store Pep Boys. You know where mm -hmm. you, uh, yeah. Well, they, on 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 this planet, uh, they have one guy operating it because it's called Pep Boy, and uh, the little franchises that they have on this little planet. There's about 150 people there, and they're going to have their first contact with aliens. It's really fun to write. It's like an Abbott and Costello movie. In fact, I think that. Um, Abbott and Costello influenced the first thing Billy and I ever worked on, which is another project we would like to sell. It's called Spacemen from Planet Judy. And uh, it's about the day that Earth is invaded by a fleet of pink spaceships from the planet Judy, which is considered the gay haven world of the universe. It's where all gays can live in complete peace without any kind of, of uh, harassment. And they've come to take all of Earth's gays to Judy. And Arnie and Mervyn are these two plumbers in New York. Think of Lou Costello and, and Bud Abbott, who inadvertently get put on this spaceship and taken to the planet Judy. By the way, the planet Judy is named after Judy Garland. So this is a this is a pretty crazy <laughs> space for us. But I always pitch it as if Abbott and Costello were still working today, this would be the Abbott and Costello movie they should make. And it's really a funny and it's a very positive gay, you know, it has a positive gay side. It's not like we're putting gays up to ridicule. It's actually the heroes in the movie are gay. So it's uh, it's actually it's a fun story. And um, as you can see, uh, the mentality for my scripts runs full gamut. <laughs> <laughs> we also we also did a we wrote a spoof of the great courtroom drama Twelve Angry Men. We've got a script circulating right now called Twelve Anxious Men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all your movies has kind of got that that Plan Nine from Outer Space kind of aesthetic to it. I like that. You know, we tried to just there's no uh, sacred subject. We'll tack everything and anything and. Uh, I just think that when people, I really want people to come to the movies when they see our stuff and just have fun. It's like a throwback. You know, I, I light a candle to anybody who can get a movie made because it's so difficult. So many ducks have to be lined up. But I, my for my money, John, there are too many dramas today. There are not enough comedies. We know how bad the world is. And I think that a lot of us who go to the movies, 
we want to go to a different world and forget about the world that we live in for a little bit. And that's where I go back to my kid when I was a kid, you know, seeing those Sinbad movies, you know, just getting in seeing those first science fiction movies. I completely forgot where I was for two hours. And I think the entertainment value there was off the charts. And I think we need to have more of that today. I, I, you know, the Marvel movies do that, but, you know, they, they they have their own thing. And, you know, to get a Marvel movie costs about $200 million. Well, I think <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I think my la- the last great comedy series I ever got to watch, and I, you know, it, this is just for me personally, was the Police Academy series. I love those and I still go back to them and I got my son hooked on them. He loves them. And I was just telling that to Luke, Luke's, uh, the guy that founded this podcast thing with me. Um, he, uh, we were talking about, he's never seen them. And I was like, how is it? You're a kid from the eighties and you've never seen police Academy. He goes, (laughs) didn't care really. You know, I was like, Oh, you need to watch them because I mean, yes, the, the, the picture quality, Obviously, it's not 4K and it, it looks dated, but they still hold up in terms of joke telling and story and everything. It's funny. I um, um, I saw them and loved them. I, I uh, the, the Seth Rogen type comedies that have come out, Pineapple Express, and This Is the End. They have a little touch of that. You know, they're they're irreverent and fun. Uh, I wish I wish Seth made more of them. Um, we've got the comic talent out there. It's just a question of putting them all in the movie. You know, I watched the other day. I was watching It's a Mad, 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 Mad World from '63. You know, the fact that they were able that Stanley Kramer was able to put everybody in that movie. You know, some of the great comedy talents. I wish we could do that today. You know, we have we've got comedy talent. We've got funny people. They're just looking for the right vehicle to get involved in them. And I'm hoping that it'll be some of our projects. We'll see. You know, last movie I've ever seen that was like that Stanley Kramer movie was Rat Race, where they had a bunch of, you know, they had um, John Cleese. They had Rowan Atkinson. Cuba Goodney in that as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sure. Sure. I think that people want to get away. They want to see this kind of stuff. And I just have to the, being a screenwriter in Hollywood sometimes is a little lonely because you, you you don't you don't sell screenplays anymore. You have to sell, quote unquote, the package. So you got to have your director. You got to have one of your stars. You got to have all this together and then they'll look at you. And uh, that's that's our goal these days. We're actually looking for a comedy director for a number of our shows, because I my theory is if you send somebody a script up without a director attached, it means it's not been vetted. And a script that's not been vetted is not going to see any light in a uh, company that's buying scripts. That's my theory. Well, moving on to the one question I wanted to ask, going back to James Bond, something I've never understood. What happened in between you only live twice and diamonds are forever? Where did George Lazenby come in? Lazenby or Lazby or however you say his name. Uh, Lazenby. Uh, The irony is (laughs) I'm having dinner with George Lazenby tonight. That's very funny. Um, Well, Connery decided that he did not want to do any more Bond movies. The the schedules were way too long. He was tired of the character. He'd worked with Hitchcock the previous year on Marnie. So he'd already seen that he could work with other top directors and he didn't see Bond in his future. So they had to find somebody new. George Lazenby walked into Cubby's office in London. He, um, He claimed that he'd done a number of films in Eastern Europe and that he thought he would be a perfect Bond candidate. Someone had recommended him for Bond. And they were very impressed with him right away. They thought he was, uh, he looked the part. He was a great looking guy. He was athletic. Little did they know that he had virtually no acting experience whatsoever. He lied through his teeth to get an audition. And when they hired him and Peter Hunt found out that he was going to play Bond and with no experience, he almost had a heart attack. This is Peter Hunt's coming out party. He had edited the first five Bond movies. They had given him the director chair for the first time on this movie. It was going to be his directing debut. I think it's a great credit to Peter and George that they managed to do this movie. And in some circles, people think it's the best produced Bond movie ever. Now, Lazenby, 
in some circles is considered a bit of a lightweight and a little wooden. I think he's terrific. He looks so comfortable as Bond. You'd think he'd been playing it for years. And I, it just was one of those lightning in a bottle moments where you got this right guy in the right part. And uh, But Lazenby did not have a great time making the movie. I think uh, Hunt told me, the director said that I can't give him too much instruction. It's going to confuse him. It's going to muddle his performance. So in many cases, Hunt stayed away from Lazenby. And Lazenby felt a little isolated being the newbie. And then when the film finished shooting, his agent at the time gave him what would probably be considered the worst advice anyone has ever been given in the history of Hollywood. He literally told Lazenby that Bond was over and done. Get out of this contract. Get out of this series. Go find something else to do. And so he walked away from Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman. And... Uh, he grew a beard during the promotional time. He was just uh, not not happy, and because uh, he he was making money selling cars, he was. I think he he didn't feel like he didn't have to worry about money at the time. But um, meanwhile, the movie comes out. I think it was uh, Christmas '69, and doesn't do very well. And compared to the grosses on the previous James Bond movies, it was lower. Not not a bomb but not what the United Artists people thought. So that's when David Picker, who was a United Artists executive, goes to London uh, and, or wherever it was, maybe Scotland, and makes a deal with Sean to come back and do one more Diamonds in, in return for them backing two Scottish films of Sean's choice that would employ some locals. So that's why we got Sean Connery back to do Diamonds Are Forever in 71. And then he walked until he comes back 12 years later for McClory and that remake of Thunderball, Never Say Never Again. Yeah, because I was always curious about that, about that, that break in the continuity. You know, it was like Connery and then Lazenby and then Connery again. I was like, well, what happened? Did Connery get sick or something like that? You know, uh, have you seen the Lazenby film? Mm -mm. I haven't been able to find it. It's really I worth seeing. First of all, Peter Hunt really was fortunate because he got probably one of the best of Ian Fleming's novels. I mean, this is Bond versus Blofeld in Switzerland. And he meets Tracy, who uh, he falls in love with, played by Diana Rigg, who was just coming off the Avengers. So she was hot as hot can be. So, yeah, I recommend that movie highly. Honor Majesty's Secret Service, 1969. I'll have to see if it's on digital. I'm still one of them old school people that still likes to buy and hold it physically in my hands. <laughs> sure, sure. My, my kid gets on me all the time. He goes, Dad, you know it's up in the cloud now, right, old man? You can, you can buy it digital and you don't take up all the room. I said, yeah, but I enjoy looking at it and seeing it's on my shelf. And he's just I, I, have, I have the same attitude towards books. <laughs> My friend's trying to get me to get one of those Kindles where I can put 100,000 books on the Kindle. I say, I like to hold a book in my hand when I'm reading it, and I like to smell the pages. <laughs> I like your books. I've actually ordered uh, the Twilight Zone and the James Bond, but I ordered physicals because I'm like you. There's just something about turning a page that just I enjoy. I sure. mean, I've got a closet over here that's just – full of books i guess i'm one of those what do they call them those uh hoarders <laughs> I'm like a board no, you're not you're, you're you're a book lover and book lovers love to see their books i'm the same way i i think it's uh you know it, it is interesting though because uh, i'm we're remodeling our house and i've got to move everything out and i'll look at a book and i'll say should i just give this away or should i hold on to it and something draws me to keep that book i i feel like i read it it's part of me, and it's hard for me to part with old books. Here's a book that I've been reading recently. It's uh, 50 Greatest Movies That Were Never Made. Oh, interesting, interesting. Uh, George Miller's uh, Justice League that he tried to make after uh, Mad, Mad Max. Max. Mad Max, wow, wow. Interesting. Well, th I should have put Spaceman from Planet Judy in that book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
I'm definitely going to have to watch that one. That one just sounds like <laughs> that one and then the uh, 7-Eleven BC. <laughs> there you go. And don't forget 12 Anxious Men. <laughs> With your Twilight Zone book, uh, what per- kind of got you into that, which I'm pretty sure you were a kid at the time that the original s- series came out or – yeah, I walked, into the, I walked into the living room one night and my parents were watching the Twilights. I had no idea what they were watching. They were watching an episode called The Silence. And it was an episode about this private club where there's this motor mouth who won't shut up. And this old officer uh, says to him, I'll pay you a half a million dollars if you don't talk for a year. And they put him in this glass cage in the basement and they monitor him. And I watched that for about 10 minutes. And it totally freaked me out, the idea of not talking for a year from a nine-year-old's point of view. So I didn't come back to the Twilight Zone ever until much later when they were in reruns. But um, I became friendly with Carol Serling, Rod's widow. And she um, she helped me um, on a number of fronts. We actually uh, I actually decided one day that I want to direct something. You know, because you never know when somebody gives you an opportunity and maybe you say, well, I could direct that. So I I decided that I was going to remake a Twilight Zone episode. So I took one of my favorites, again, time travel. It's the one called The Seventh is Made Up of Phantoms. It's about a modern tank that's on maneuvers in South Dakota, and they suddenly discover that they're following the line of Custer and they're in a time warp. And I remade that at Camp Pendleton in, near San Diego, and uh, we got the U.S. Marines to cooperate. It was more like an experimental film. So I got a little bit into the zone. And then when I was under contract at Showtime, we almost got a Rod Serling biopic off the ground. It didn't quite happen, but I collected a lot of research. And having done the James Bond movie encyclopedia, I said, you know something? I bet we could have fun with the Twilight Zone encyclopedia. And I really uh, got a a lot of help from Carol. First of all, she supplied me with most of my photographs from Rod's own files. And then she gave me access to the original contracts so I could tell you how much people made in those days. But the main goal of the book was to get information out on the actors. I maintain that that five-year run of Twilight Zones had the best acting class ever. And I tell you a bit about the background of people like Burgess Meredith and Jack Klugman, uh, Robert Redford, one of his first pictures. So there's a biography, there's over 500 bios in the book on everybody associated with the Twilight Zone and their relationships to other actors who they previously worked with. Burgess Meredith was one of the most reoccurring actors on that show, wasn't he? He and Klugman both did four. And uh, I think John Anderson also did four. Uh, yeah, no, they did very well. Top of show in those days, if you were the star of a Twilight Zone, you could make $5,000. That was it. Seems kind of ridiculous today, but back in 1960. Was a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Then, then the, the little character parts that have are so much a part of those shows, you know, people were making $400, $600 for a day. It was just funny to see those numbers. Was Serling's uh, inspiration for that show based around his um, experiences in World War II? Was a lot of well, it? he was you know going back to the whole PTSD thing. Rod was a traumatized paratrooper in the Philippines. He saw some horrific things happen. He came back to Chicago after the war, and he was in therapy. And they said you've got to channel this this trauma into something, and he poured it into his writing. He, uh, before the war, back in Binghamton, New York, where he grew up, uh, he loved the movies. You know, he saw the King Kongs and the Draculas and Frankenstein movies. He and his brother would go to the cinema a lot. So he already was into fantasy and speculative science fiction. But his frustration comes a little bit later. After the war, he became a top radio writer, and then he became a live television writer. But just like we were talking about Emmett Till earlier, You know, he wasn't allowed to do anything controversial on television. Anytime he got into morality plays, they would shut him up. And so uh, he found that science fiction and fantasy was the way to tell his morality tales. Just like we talked about uh, the episode uh, Eye of the Beholder. On the surface, it's a science fiction episode, but it's really more about racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this lady's uh, in a hospital and she's 
getting ready to have plastic surgery and finds out she's on a planet of pig people or whatever. And it's got these weird looking faces. Oh yeah. That practical Basically. effect makeup still holds up today. A oh, lot yeah. of that, that's Bill Tuttle, Bill Tuttle. And, uh, yeah, he did great work. I, I particularly like the work he did on the devil in the episode, the howling man where they, this monastery somewhere in Europe has trapped the devil in a, in a, you know, a cell in the basement and this wanderer try is, is, is kind of hypnotized into releasing him. It was just a really creepy episode. That's one of my favorites. Now, Orson Welles was supposed to be the original narrator of that show, right? But him and Serling kind of had a falling out. They didn't really get along. And No, no, no nothing like that. Uh, uh, they had no budget for Orson Welles. They were on a, a very strict budget. They couldn't afford him. So Rod, the first season, does the audio introduction. And then starting in the second season, because of the success of shows like Alfred Hitchcock, where he would come out and talk, they realized that having Rod on camera, Rod was a very handsome man. So having him on camera to introduce the shows became a positive. And then he started to do the commercials and he did it all that promotion to keep it on the air. The Twilight Zone was not a big hit. In fact, uh, the, the head of the studio, James Aubrey, was always trying to cancel it because he did not like anthology. His belief was people want to watch the same actor every week. They want to watch Jim Arness on Gunsmoke. They want to watch Elliot, uh, Robert Stack as Elliot Ness on The Untouchables. They like Lucy on I Love Lucy. Everything else didn't mean anything. So actually, after three seasons, Aubrey just put his foot down. I'm ending this run. And they canceled The Twilight Zone. They brought in a series called Fair Exchange, which was not. And it bombed. And um, they, uh, Aubrey had to call Serling and say, can you bring back the zone mid-season as an hour? So what we get in fourth season are 18 one-hour episodes, which, by the way, are very good. Over the years, they've, they, they've been disparaged as being a little padded, but there are some really terrific Twilight Zone episodes in that fourth season. Was that uh, around the time that... Um they lost out on CBS and he had to move over to ABC. No, no. The, the five seasons that Serling produced were all CBS. And when and the show they, was finally canceled after the fifth season, when they went back to the half hours, there was talk of him pitching another show around town, but it didn't go. Yeah. What was it called? Like wizards and warlocks, witches, wizards yeah, and yeah, witches, wizards and warlocks or something like that. But um, the next time you really see, uh Serling in the genre is Night Gallery, which uh, many people think that Serling show, and it was not Serling show. He was hired gun to, to do some writing and to host, but that's a Jack Laird show. And I don't think the quality control was present there because Night Gallery was all over the place. It's funny. I still remember vaguely late 70s and a lot of the 80s how – horror anthology or sci-fi anthology just went rampant i mean you had uh amazing stories i think it was by steven spielberg you sure. had um the outer realms which the outer realms i think was like competition for twilight zone wasn't it well that was not later that was during that was right after the Twilight. you're not you're talking about the outer limits yes 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 outer limits yeah sorry yeah and no that was wrong. very very much like the Twilight Zone. It was a little more science fiction. And of course, they were ours. Uh, interestingly, today, uh, we've got that show, that British show. Um, it just went out of my head. You know what I'm talking about. It's uh, um, it's an hour-long British show. Uh, something about Windows? Is it Windows? Um, not windows. Um, mirrors. Uh, this uh, Dark Mirror. Yeah, it comes on Netflix. Yeah, Dark Mirror is a terrific Twilight Zone type anthology series with very high quality. I highly recommend that. Definitely. Yeah, I watched the one episode where they uh the guy lies and says that he's captured this politician's daughter and he has to do something with a farm animal or <laughs> his daughter's gonna be killed. Well then comes to find out his daughter was never kidnapped and the guy, and then this guy shames himself in front of his entire country on TV by doing this lewd act with this animal. And 
the person that told him to do it commits suicide. He just wanted to, to embarrass an entire country or it's a leader. Crazy, huh? And then the guy's wife left him because she couldn't be with him anymore after that happened. And yeah, guys, you all that listen to this episode, if you haven't seen that, it's, it's dark. <laughs> it's a so, dark mirror. That's for sure. <laughs> parental guidance is suggested. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it does have that Twilight Zone kind of feel to it. And, and the revivals didn't work for me. I never got into the color Twilight Zones because like I said earlier, I just think the Twilight Zone needs to be in black and white. It's just, I'm sorry. I just, I tried out the new series and I watched a couple episodes and I was underwhelmed. So there you have it. Yeah, my favorite episode of Twilight Zone will always be Steel about the box. Oh, it was Lee Marvin. Sure. Battling Maxo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a great episode. I actually went to Las Vegas to interview the guy he boxes in that final match. And uh, it was interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. That's a great episode. Well, Lee Marvin was actually in two. He's also in one of the Western episodes. Uh, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It, but, but just this goes to show you how beloved Twilight Zone is. People remember episode names. And there are virtually no other television series where you remember episode names. And Twilight Zone, you, I mean, Eye of the Beholder, The Howling, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. There's a funny story on Nightmare. You know, William Shatner is in that airline seat looking at the guy on the wing. Uh, during the making of that, they worked on, a, on a, um, a set with a tank because there has to be all this wind and rain going on the wing while the creature's digging up the cowling on the motor. So, so that episode was directed by Richard Donner, who later directed the Superman movies I and didn't know that. Yeah, Lethal Weapon, etc. So Donner goes over to the craft service table to get some coffee, and he hears a scream from the set. He comes running back with his coffee, and down at the bottom of the tank is uh, Shatner's body, and everybody's screaming, "Oh my God! Oh my God! We lost Shatner!" And then, of course, he sits up and looks up at Donner and winks at him. It's just a joke. <laughs> They say Shatner to this day is. They say Shatner to this day, even in his nineties, has still got that child mentality about him. Like he just, and maybe that's what's just keeping him going. Because God knows he does not look ninety. I know miracles of plastic surgery, but he looks yeah. like he's in his fifties. Well, I think being on that Star Trek show, uh, he probably went into some machine and made sure that he'd be youthful in his nineties. <laughs> had an argument about that the other day with somebody that we were arguing about best star Trek shows. And I said, nothing will ever beat the original series. I, I like next generation, but there was something about that original series that none of the rest of those shows ever touched Thursday nights for all those three years, I was riveted. And I still remember being a high school student and just can't wait to come home to watch star Trek. That was just special. I, I, I have to say that I haven't watched any of the other iterations. I have seen the movies. I thought the first J.J. Abrams was pretty good, although it was a little convoluted. But uh, that, that's the only one I really liked. I, I thought the guy who played um, uh, Spock, Zachary Quinto, was just oh, shocking. Was. Oh, my God. That's Spock. He looked just like young Nimoy. It freaked me out. I was like, what in the hell? Did they do like this deep fake stuff? And but then at that time, that deep fake technology didn't exist yet. As and a public, he... as a publicist, I was hired to go on the road with Leonard Nimoy when he was doing his one man show as Vincent Van Gogh's brother. So <laughs> I remember we're in um, we're in Aurora, Illinois, and we're at dinner. I'm having dinner with Leonard Nimoy and the team. And every time I start to talk about Star Trek, he tells me, Steve, this is a theater play. We talk theater. We don't talk TV. <laughs> Good old Leonard. <laughs> they said that he had kind of like a, I'll do it, but I don't care for it kind of mentality with it. But I think he embraced it later on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with, when they got the movies. You could tell there was a big difference in his acting because – he carried those movies in the eighties. I mean, it was all about Spock to me, you know, 
in sure. those movies. Sure. And McCoy was always my favorite. DeForest Kelly, I love all of his old westerns. I love just his chemistry with Nimoy and Shatner. I don't think that will ever be replicated ever again. No, I agree. I agree. By the way, I want to tell people about my podcast if it's cool. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I have a podcast. It's called Steve Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movies. It's R-U-B-I-N. And each week we deal with film history. Um, uh, I've had some really interesting guests. I had Nick Meyer on talking about the time travel science fiction film Time After Time. Uh, he talked about that. I had Billy Gray on talking about the day the earth stood still. Um, having a lot of fun with it. It's on the Amazon, Apple, and Spotify apps. If you want to check it out, it's a lot of fun. Well, go check it out, guys. Uh, quick question. Does uh, Lou Costello's granddaughter do podcasts by chance? Because I want to reach out to her and be like, hey, I am such a huge fan of your grandfather. I would love to. Well, I can get you her contact information. We'll do that off camera. That, that'd be easy. Yeah. Sure, John. I sure do appreciate it. It's been I already, a lot of fun today. I, I love your enthusiasm. I am a movie nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Point blank. I am just a movie nerd. Everybody thinks I'm all about horror movies. And yes, that's my favorite genre. But there's other genres out there I love. I love classic comedy. I like the old, hell, I watch old silent movies. And that weirds people out. They're like, but they're not talking. I was like, you're missing the point of a silent movie. <laughs> the dialogue is in their body language and in the set and the location that they're in. Like my favorite horror movie, one of my top fives is cabinet of Dr. Caligari, German expressionist film. And there doesn't need to be dialogue. You get the sense of everything that's going on and just that that nightmarish dream world they created it's so beautiful that movie is a hundred years old as of last year and it still holds up a century later god love the old ones absolutely they'll always be with us well thank you well i can't wait to get your books in the mail so i can read them finally but um if anybody wants the James Bond movie encyclopedia or the Twilight Zone encyclopedia, best place probably right now to get them is on Amazon. That's where I bought them. And uh, you can get them Kindle edition or physical. Um, I know everybody likes the ease of the Kindle, but I still like filling that, that paper. Sure, my fingers. sure. <laughs> well, Steve, it has been a true honor and a true pleasure to meet you. I um, want to say thanks to uh, Steve Joyner for – making this all happen for us and anytime I could ever have you back on, I would love to. Thanks John. I really appreciate it. Love talking about movie history and just all this stuff. I can sit sit here for hours and talk to you, (laughs) but I know you got got a life to live. So I get that. (laughs) Wait, somebody was trying to ask a question. I think, what did they say? I haven't cut. Are we live? Are we live? Yeah, we were. I mean, we're live. Wow, I didn't know. Said Abbott and Costello is one of, if not the greatest of all time. Yeah, them and Cheech and Chong and Lauren Hardy. <laughs> well, hey, Steve, it has, it has been a pleasure. And uh, I I'll hope send you, I'll send you that contact information on uh, Marky. Nope. I appreciate it, my friend. Stay safe out there, man. You too. And uh, talk to you later. <laughs> Well, everybody, that was Mr. Steve Rubin. Such a pleasure to talk to him. I am a huge James Bond 007 fan, huge Twilight Zone fan, just movie fan in general. And he is like a walking encyclopedia of movie knowledge. I mean, we talked before we actually started broadcasting, and it was just, I was blown away. I was like, my God, this guy knows everything everything dates times episodes years who was the producer who was the director who was the actors in it it was like wow but yeah if you all want his books you can go on amazon and uh, get both the james bond encyclopedia Um, i want to say he has his war films book on there as well there's an anne frank children's book and the twilight zone book so uh make sure you go on there and get a copy of those you can get them on kindle or physical i prefer to physical 
like I said, I just enjoy turning pages because I'm old like that and enjoy that shit. But, uh, yeah, Doomsday, don't worry about it, man. You can watch it after I upload it. I know everybody, it's the weekends and everybody's got stiff to do. But anyway, guys, uh, if you catch me tomorrow, I will have Mr. Travis Dunn on the show tomorrow. And he, I'll give you the time here. Let me pull it up. Come on. I think it's time for me to buy a new phone. So if you're on the East Coast, let's see, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. So it'll be 3 p.m. tomorrow on Eastern for Travis Dunn and will be 12 noon Pacific. Uh, Travis Dunn played in such movies as, let me pull those up. I know it was Decapitarium and Murder Comes to Town, both indie horror films, true crime films, I think, as well. But, uh, yeah, join us tomorrow for that. And if you miss this today, don't worry about it. It'll be on YouTube. Go give it a watch, man. Uh, Steve Rubin was awesome. And also, he has a podcast. I will make sure to put the link to that in the description of this video as well. But guys, I got to go get out of here. I got stuff I got to do today. And uh, those of you that join me, whether you join now or earlier, whenever, I sure do appreciate it. It's appreciate I appreciate all the support, all the love you guys give us. You make this thing worth doing. And uh, with that being said, it's been your old buddy John. And I'll see you again next time on, get over here and click it, Behind the Feed. Ooh.